Our next speaker is Joseph Camilleri. Joseph is Emeritus Professor at La Trobe University in Melbourne, a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia and Convener of Conversation at the Crossroads and of Shape, Saving Humanity and Planet Earth. Joseph has authored, co-authored or edited over 30 books, including The End of Sovereignty and Worlds in Transition. His research has focused on security studies, international political economy, the foreign policies of great powers, the international relations of the Asia-Pacific region, and the philosophy, method, and practice of dialogue. Now, isn't that a good thing? Um, the title of his address today is Breaking Our Addiction to Empire, A New Vision of Security. Joseph Camilleri. Thank you, Mary, and uh, like everyone else, I would like to begin by paying my respects uh, to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose land we stand, and uh, to Indigenous Elders, past, present and emerging, and look forward to the day when justice and recognition so long overdue will have been given them. I should add that uh, I've had the pleasure and the honour of being on the organising committee for this uh, project, this conference, working with John Shipton, Cohn and others, and it has been uh, a most worthwhile experience in the preparation to today, and I thank, of course, all of those who've taken up the invitation to be with us. We live in a transformative moment in human history the likes of which there have probably been only four or five over the last 200,000 years. And this may be the most significant of those. We either understand that or we don't. It's got to be in our blood. This is one of the most, perhaps the most, critical moment in the history of the human species. And Assange, is an exceptional, remarkable man who has accomplished so much to make us aware of the implications of this and whose life currently hangs in the balance. In today's proceedings, we've heard a great deal about the persecution and vindictiveness to which Julian Assange has been subjected. The flagrant abuse of human rights, disregard for the rule of law, which this sordid saga has brought to the fore, the craven complicity of governments, mainstream media in the execution of this willful and seemingly interminable crime. All of which bears saying and repeating uh, because it speaks truth to power. But there is another aspect which for me is pivotal to the Assange epic. After all, the Assange story has parallels. Think Navalny in Russia. Prime Minister and cricket legend Imran Khan currently languishing in a Pakistani jail on some 85 trumped up charges. But Russia and Pakistan, and many of the others, don't pretend to be great democracies or exemplary upholders of human rights. They don't portray themselves as paragons of virtue. The Russian political class, not least Putin, has no qualms using extreme nationalist rhetoric to glorify the Russian past and justify the use of force. But not so the United States. You've got to understand this. Its entire rationale for exercising global power is its self-proclaimed mission to preserve freedom everywhere. Nobody else does that. To entrench the observance of human rights, to preside over a rules-based international order. It portrays itself as the standard bearer of the democratic ethic and the principal bulwark against authoritarianism 
wherever it reads, rears its ugly head. In the wake of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, we should cast our mind back, and the fall of the Berlin Wall, George Bush, in a, in a statement of the joint session of the US Congress, asserted America's commitment to a new world order. Quote, a new era, free from the threat of terror, stronger in the pursuit of justice, more secure in the quest for peace, an era in which the nations of the world, east and west, north and south, can prosper and live in harmony. And four years later, in his address to the UN General Assembly, Bill Clinton echoed those sentiments. He spoke of a new world and a struggle between freedom and tyranny, between tolerance and bigotry, between knowledge and ignorance, between openness and isolation. He spoke of the United States as the leader of a free, not a leader, the leader of a free world, governed by laws in opposition to those who impose their will by force. Our struggle today, he went on, is the age-old fight between hope and despair. And then a few years later, at the height of the war on terror, came a series of extraordinary revelations by WikiLeaks that shook the US, US diplomacy and the US strategic, industrial, scientific, and media complex to its core. You've got to understand that. Some 10 million documents, I doubt that any single person has read them all, I certainly haven't, but I've read enough to understand why the US security establishment decided that Julian Assange had to be destroyed. It was a conscious decision at the highest level, percolating through all arms of government, not the doing of a handful. That would be a gross uh, misunderstanding of what had happened. And so, in a relatively short space of time, what had Julian accomplished? The entire edifice of US self-justification and propaganda came crashing down. No one could now say that they believed still in those pious words who had bothered to look at anything. To make the point, let me share a few snippets from the WikiLeaks encyclopedia that demonstrates the devastating blow uh, that WikiLeaks has delivered. US, standard bearer of human rights or arch violator? Question mark. In the WikiLeaks disclosures, we read that in Iraq, prison, prison abuse by coalition forces was and remained rampant even after the Abu Ghraib, Abu Ghraib scandal. Secondly, we read that prisoners at uh, Guantanamo Bay were denied access to the Red Cross for many, many weeks. US, supporter of rules-based order or indiscriminate use of force. The WikiLeaks re revelation tell us in 2007, a US Army helicopter gunned down in cold blood two Reuters journalists in Baghdad. Two years later, U.S. planes bombed a village in southern Yemen, all disclosed, killing 14 women and 21 children without so much as an apology. You, we read, U.S. military special operation forces conducted offensive operations inside Pakistan, while U.S. officials repeatedly denied such claims. In the space of just five years, we read, between 2004 and 2009, more than 66,000 civilians suffered violent deaths. And contrary to arms control agreements, we read in the WikiLeaks uh, disclosures that dozens of US tactical nuclear weapons had been surreptitiously deployed in Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium, contrary to arms control agreements. U.S. standard bearer of property or corruption. The Secretary of State's office, we were told, we, we were informed, encouraged U.S. diplomats at the U.N. to spy on their counterparts without discrimination by collecting biographic and uh, biometric information. We read that the Obama administration worked with Republicans 
to protect the Bush administration officials who faced a criminal investigation into torture. It makes no difference who is the present, uh, president at a given time, just as it makes no difference who is the prime minister in Australia at a given time. <laughs> Af uh, Afghan president Hamid Karzai was compelled by outside pressure, you can guess who, to free suspected drug dealers. And during the US occupation, Afghanistan became the center of the global opium trade. The United States, all this is in WikiLeaks, made a deal with the UK, allowing it to keep cluster bombs in the UK despite the ban on the munitions signed by Gordon Brown, Prime Minister. The United States persuaded the British government to protect America's interests during the Ch Chilcot inquiry into the Iraq war so that nothing embarrassing would come to light. US, champion of freedom or oppression, we read in WikiLeaks, the US were shipping arms to Saudi Arabia, paragon of democracy, for use in northern Yemen, even as it denied any role in the conflict. And the CIA was tasked with cultivating close links with top officials in many Arab countries, most of them despotism, unlimited. What then is WikiLeaks and Julian Assange's achievement? It is that they exposed the entire projection of US global power for what it is as it has never been done before, because all the evidence was there and no one could deny it. What did they reveal? An unrelating pursuit of power for its own sake and for the privileges and fortunes it dispenses to those who direct them what to do and who know how to take advantage of it. And so, the well-orchestrated proclamation of high-sounding principles was exposed as a complete sham. Complete, unadulterated sham. A colossal fabrication designed to deceive the world's publics at home and abroad. Yes, much of this was known, or at least guessed at, prior to these revelations but never before with such crushing evidence uh, that could not and was not disputed. So where is our Australian government or governments in all of this? We know that one government after another, for at least the last 20 and probably more years, have sought at every turn to strengthen the military alliance with the United States. We have pursued an overarching strategic orientation which has led to ever higher levels of inter interoperability with the US military, intimate links with US intelligence and security operations, and heavy reliance on the acquisition of expensive US military hardware. What after all? is the meaning of AUKUS. And then we've seen rapidly expanding joint military exercises with the United States and its regional allies. Under the, two, two, uh, under the 2014 Defence Posture Agreement, increased cooperation between the ADF, the Australian Defence Force, and the US Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy and Army. Increasing integration of Australian bases and personnel into US war plans the forward deployment of US strategic bombers and submarines, rapidly transforming Australia into a platform for the projection of US military power. And the steep rise in Australia's defense budget as a, ref as a reflection and in support of US strategic planning. How could a government that does those things come to a song? How could you come to the defense when you do not say that you appreciate the US crimes that have been repeatedly committed? How can you say that you wish to defend someone who has totally exploded the facade of US virtue, the, the US state? 
And so with so much rhetoric, money, institutional energy, invested in the tightening of the US alliance, it is little wonder that Australian diplomacy has lost any freedom of action it may have once possessed. Australian ministers, including Prime Minister, don't operate on the assumption that they have freedom of action. They are surrounded by their minders, and it is the job of the minders to pay attention to those who are powerful. And they interpret the wishes of the powerful very, very clearly. And they say to the minister or ministers, you may not cross that red line, you will be skinned alive. That's what happens, constantly, day in, day out. Which Albanese or Penny Wong would stand in this way? Really? So, despite a few words aimed at softening some of the rough edges of Australian diplomacy under coalition governments, the Albanese government has generally complied with strategic priorities and preparation for war. If anything, it has become much more forceful in pursuing this line than even the Morrison government or some of the preceding uh, coalition governments. Yes, a few words. We want this matter of Assange resolved. Uh, it is time to bring the story to resolution. But there is more to this, and we've got to understand this. It's not just a handful of timid politicians knowing where the wind blows when it comes to power. They believe, rightly or wrongly, that the mood of the Australian public, especially white Australia, is behind the alliance with the United States. And no matter what they think about the rights and wrongs of US actions, they would never wish to endanger it. They think they know that. This is a view that has permeated Australian thinking since colonial settlement. The view is still widespread in Australia, or so it seems, white Australia, that we are organically connected to the West and, and we are largely suspicious and ignorant of the cultures and wisdom of the First Nations and the cultures, faiths and civilizations of the Orient. We feel threatened. As many writers have, in the field have said, we are the frightened country, the anxious country. And for that we need protection. And for that, we need the protection of the empire. It was once the British Empire, it is now the American Empire. And we can't get that protection unless we are absolutely clear that we are 100% loyal to the protector. That's the premium we have to pay for this insurance policy. And it's worth it. Now, if you think that's not the view of the, in the mainstream of white Australia, then we have uh, the task ahead of us uh, to inform our leaders that there is a real groundswell wanting to uh, move in a different direction. But if they are right in thinking that this is the way Australians think, white Australians in particular, uh, then we have a job ahead of us. And the job is very simple. Easy to say, I know, and extremely hard to do. We have to shift from a notion of militarized security to human security. The security that comes with economic and social well-being. Respect for human rights and environmental values. A security that meets the needs of people at home and abroad. We have to strive for the common security of all peoples and certainly the peoples of our region. And we have to do it cooperatively and comprehensively. This, by the way, is a backdrop to a new initiative, I hope a major one, it's a certainly an ambitious one, uh, that one of the sponsors, co-sponsors of this uh, uh, conference uh, is beginning to outline and uh, 
and has already announced. And if you're interested, um, you can find the four-page leaflet, A Vision for Australia from Militarised Security to Human Security. So what do we conclude? That a pall of national shame has descended on the evening lands. I think we know what the evening lands are. And we must do all we can to lift ourselves from this morass. We, to this, we must do all we can to assist Julian Assange in his hour, in need, and hour of need. But importantly, we must preserve his legacy, regardless of what happens to him. We must preserve his legacy and ensure that his unimaginable suffering serves a purpose, the purpose he intended and which can take Australia in a different direction. And I'm reminded as I conclude the powerful message that Edward Snowden has conveyed in his book and some interviews. He says, what counts in this difficult, troubled times is not what you believe in. Of course, it's important to believe the right things, but it's not that. It's what you are prepared to do in support of your beliefs. What you are prepared, these are his words, to sacrifice. Time, energy, relationships, money, assets and to do so with total generosity. The question before us, are we able to rise to the challenge? Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for putting so eloquently uh, why it's important to strive for a different Australia, an independent Australia.